Okay, here's the third installment of the uh, video PowerPoint lecture on deviants. Um, the last slide you saw should have been this one, and we're going to kind of pick up here as well. Robert K. Merton's deviance typology, and this is discussed in your book around page 204, 205, if you have the most recent edition. Um, the classic theory in deviance, uh, Merton sets out that we have cultural goals. Now, by definition, cultural goals are objectives that are held out as legitimate or desirable for members of a society to achieve. So, for example, earning money, uh, making, making a substantial income is an accepted cultural goal within our culture. Most people want to make a living, make pretty good money, if not a lot of money. Nothing wrong with that. So we can either reject that goal or accept it. Most of us accept it. Some people say, you know, forget it. I don't care about making money. You know, and that's fine. We'll talk about that in a second. So if you have agreed to that cultural goal of making money, um, there are institutionalized means of going about it. Now, the definition of institutionalized means, and this is in your book too, and you'll also want to have this in your notes, approved ways or appropriate ways of reaching cultural goals. Okay, so let's let's look at the typology here. Let's say the cultural goal is to make money. Okay, conformity. If you conform to this typology, that means that you accept the goal of making money, and you accept the legitimate means of going about it. So a legitimate way of making money in society is to get a job, right? You go to college first, get a job. Sounds pretty good. Now, you can also accept the cultural goal of making money, but reject the appropriate means to do it. And this is called innovation, okay? I deal in the, in the prison system with innovators. We think of innovation as being a positively connotated term. Not necessarily. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the wealthiest people, one of the richest people I ever knew was a drug dealer in prison. He accepted the cultural goal that was set out for him in this society of making money, but he didn't want to work for it. He rejected the institutionalized means and decided to sell drugs illegally, and he made a lot of money doing it. Um, and your book gives you several other examples of innovation, embezzlers. I had a woman at Lakin, she was a female um, inmate. She embezzled a couple million dollars from company. She said, I wanted to make a lot of money. Society says that's what makes you popular, that's what makes you worth something. But she didn't want to work for it, so she embezzled. She stole it. Uh, that's innovation. Now, ritualism, we'll move here. This is someone who rejects the cultural goal, we'll say, for example, of making a lot of money. They're not interested in that. They don't care about making the money. But they accept the appropriate means of society. These are, uh, for example, these are people who, they work, they just kind of get to work, they get through their day, they accept their low pay, they don't have any aspirations to, to really get promoted or to make more money. They're just kind of going through the motions. That's, that's ritualism. Um, so, people who reject the cultural goal and also reject the institutionalized means are retreatists. This is called retreatism. Uh, if you think, for example, someone who doesn't want to make a lot of money and they don't want to work either, um, well, what are you going to do? Well, you know, the, the, uh, the hippie movement, the 1960s and the 1970s, you had people who were quote-unquote living off the land. Uh, they, ex they rejected this idea that you had to work and make a ton of money to be successful. They rejected all of that and just sort of lived out in the country and kind of fended for themselves. Um, someone who is homeless, for example, by choice, would reject the cultural goal of making money and would reject the, the appropriate means to, um, to obtain that money. So, another example. Now, sometimes people rebel. Rebellion is when someone establishes new goals and they establish new means to go about that. We're not going to talk so much about rebellion at this point, but understand, I know I've kind of beaten the horse a little bit here with this slide, but there's a lot in this slide. It's important to understand um, these, these four components especially in understanding how cultural goals and institutionalized means kind of play together. And your book does a great job of explaining and giving you other examples as well. Okay? And here's a slide. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can pause this in the video at any point. Um, you can you know, get some notes on that as well and refer back to that. So Now, I'm going to move on to labeling and deviance. Um, I've done a lot of research in, in, in this area. Labels, I feel, impact us greatly, um, especially early on. Initially, if you're given a label, a social label, whether it's good or bad, it, it tends to stick. 
um, for whatever reason. And actually, we'll, we'll talk about some of those reasons. Two types of labeling that I want to talk to you about, and you probably won't find these in your text, so you want to make sure you have good notes with these. Retrospective labeling and projective labeling. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is a, is a real life example. You can judge me if you like. Um, I'm married very happily, have been for a long time. When I was dating my, my girlfriend, who is my now wife, I remember one of the first, probably the first couple months we were together, we were supposed to go out on a date. We were supposed to meet up somewhere. And honestly, I forgot. I completely forgot. And I went out with a friend, another buddy of mine, and we went driving around. We ended up in Sissonville, you know, of all places. So I'm still living at home. I'm a teenager. I'm 18 years old. So I get home several hours later, and there's a message on my parents' answering machine. Something to the effect of, hey, we were supposed to meet. This is Sarah, who is my wife, my girlfriend at the time. Um, worried about you, you know, beep. And then there's another one, hey, it's me again, Sarah. We were supposed to meet. Worried about you. Call me. I'm thinking, oh, man, I forgot. You know, what do I say? Do I tell her the truth? Do I tell her I just forgot? Or should I make something up to kind of save myself? And at that moment, as I'm thinking at the answering machine, I hear a knock on my parents' door. It's my girlfriend. So now I've got a quick decision. I think very quickly. You know what? My car was here in the parking lot the whole time. So if she drove by and saw it, I could tell her that I was here sick because my car was here, right? And she would buy that. And I could just kind of get out of it that way. So, Or I could tell her the truth. So I decided to not tell her the truth. So she comes into the house, and I start giving her my story about how I was sick you know, I fell asleep. I'm just waking up, checking the machine. I'm so sorry. I'm thinking my car's been in, in the driveway the whole time. My story is, is soundproof. She kind of looks at me. You know that look, ladies, that you give your boyfriends when you know they're lying to you? She gives me that look. I'm thinking, oh, no. How, how does she know? She says, well, that's, that's interesting. I'm glad that you're feeling better, Brandon, because I saw you out with your buddy in Sistonville about a couple hours ago busted. I was like, oh, man. I'm thinking, what are you doing in Sissonville, first of all? Because we live in Nitro. Uh, but at any rate, she just by accident was out with a friend of hers sometime later and saw me there. So I quickly became the victim of what I call retrospective labeling. Retro means before or prior. Retrospective labeling involves judging someone's um, uh, judging someone's past or their history based on a present deviance. I'm lying to my girlfriend right now. That's the deviance. So retrospectively, she goes back. She's like, oh, okay. So you lied to me about this. What else have you lied to me about before? And I'm like, nothing. And honestly, I had not ever lied to her. She's like, nope, nope, nope. You, you lied to me now, so that means you've been lying to me about other things. What else is there? Also, I became the victim, what I would like to say, victim of projective labeling. Projective labeling is labeling someone's future based on a present deviance. So I got hit both ways. So she says to me, and ladies, you said this to your boyfriends probably, so you lie about this, once a liar, always a liar, right? So if you lie to me about this, what else are you going to lie to me about? That's projective labeling. And we do this as we stigmatize, bringing this back to sociology, as we stigmatize groups of people based on race, based on ethnicity, based on perceived mental illness, whatever, we judge them backwards, um, and we also judge them forward. Uh, we assume that just because someone is engaging in deviance now, that they've been doing it all along. Um, an example, we assumed in our country's history that African Americans were uh, intellectually inferior to Caucasians. That was an assumption, a very erroneous assumption, but one nonetheless. And the thinking late 1800s, early 1900s was that, okay, African Americans are not as smart as white people, so they're never going to be. So let's sterilize them so they can't reproduce. That actually happened in our country. There's a lot wrong with that, but the idea of projective labeling is there. So we can tie that into sociology as well. Uh, some more things with labeling and deviance. Your book talks about the medicalization of deviance. Um, and under labeling theory, I'm going to try to find exactly where that is. Somewhere around page 198, 199, uh, 200 is um, where you're going to see a discussion of, of this stuff. Now, the medicalization of deviance refers to the fact that we give a medical um, 
a medical explanation or a medical typology for deviants. Things that were considered to be just deviants before are now almost explained away uh, or excused through this medical model that we've come up with. Let me give you an example. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, if someone was an alcoholic, they were just considered to be a bum. Um, that was a choice that he or she made. They were just worthless, whatever. Those were descriptors that you would, that you would hear when people would talk about alcoholics. Now, we have alcoholism defined as a disease. It's actually a diagnosable mental health disorder. People go for treatment. They receive uh, medical treatment. There are treatment facilities all over the country designed to treat alcoholism. Now, the criticism with this, with the medicalization of deviance, is that when we assign a medical term or a label to alcoholism, people no longer have to take responsibility for their actions. They can say things like, well, it's not my fault. I have a disease. I have alcoholism. I can't help it. Where maybe they can. They just don't have to now because it's a quote-unquote medical problem or a medical disease or disorder. Same with pedophiles, grown adults who, are, who engage in sexual behaviors with children. Uh, we frown upon that very much within our society. And I hear often when I work with pedophiles in the prison system, one of the first things they say is, I have a disease, Mr. Neen. I have a disorder. I can't help it. Well, maybe, maybe not. We can all make choices. Um, I'm married. I see another woman who is attractive. I can make a choice not to act on that attraction because I'm married, right? Um, is it that simple for a pedophile? Well, if you're legitimately attracted to children as an adult, is that going to change? Probably not. However, uh, your decision to act on it, is it a disease that just can't be helped? Or can you make some decisions not to act on those impulses? And we go back and forth with that. And then we'll end this PowerPoint presentation with defining deviance down. Um, this is the next component of labeling that I want to talk to you about. Defining deviance down involves the idea of taking something that was considered deviance and redefining that. We're defining it down. We're lowering the bar, if you will. And now we are not seeing this as deviance anymore. So we're lowering the standard. Let me give you an example. Divorce is one that I used early. Uh, the, div uh, the divorce rate in the 1930s was, was minuscule. It was like, you know, 5-6% of marriages ended in divorce. You were engaging in deviance if you got a divorce. We've defined that down over the year, that, that idea of deviance with divorce down, because now most marriages end in divorce. It's not considered deviance. Cohabitation is another great example. Uh, people who live together prior to marriage. Cohabitation in the 1930s and 40s was just almost taboo. It was just considered to be very deviant. You didn't do that. Uh, now, a lot of people cohabitate, and it's not seen as being a big deal. So, um, we'll go ahead and call that the end of, of this part um, of the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you.